Welcome to the Senator George J. Mitchell Lecture on Sustainability. My name is David Hart, and I'm the director of the Mitchell Center. The Mitchell Center is a place where wonderful students and faculty, representing every college and more than 25 academic programs, have dedicated themselves to helping create a brighter economic and environmental future for communities in and beyond Maine. It might sound simple, but it's hard work, and one of the most rewarding parts of my job is to witness firsthand their deep commitment to making a difference in the world. I also pay attention to innovative sustainability programs at other colleges and universities, and I'm happy to report that UMaine is increasingly recognized as a leader, even among some of the world's finest universities. But that didn't happen by accident. It's the result of hard work by many outstanding leaders at all levels of this institution, none more so than President Sue Hunter. We're very fortunate that she took the helm of this great university at such a pivotal time and that she has led it with such passion and conviction. Please join me in welcoming President Susan J. Hunter. Well, thank you, David. Uh, very gracious comments, and I appreciate it. You know, we have to look around, and, and as we'll be talking today, I do have to give David a, a major shout out. The, the Mitchell Center on Sustainability Solutions has become, you know, so uh, renowned for the work they do, and it comes down to the leadership of the center. The man that really came here to get it started is David Hart, and he deserves enormous credit for where that center has gone and the kind of work they do. So, David, thank you. It is always, as always, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Mitchell Lecture on Sustainability. This is certainly one of the marquee events in our academic calendar, and I think it speaks volumes about UMaine's dedication to tackling sustainability challenges in and beyond the borders of Maine. It's always a pleasure to welcome Senator Mitchell to the university, and we're delighted that he's here to join us for the lecture that bears his name. We also so appreciate his participation in the lecture as well as his strong support of the Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions and the entire humane community. He was last here in August for the annual Mitchell Scholarship Institute Welcome Brunch, which is held every year for all the new Mitchell scholars and their families from throughout Maine. The Mitchell Scholars Program is a remarkable legacy of Senator Mitchell and he deserves enormous thanks for this initiative, which will benefit students from Maine for generations to come. And really, he deserves enormous credit. In my long career at UMaine, it has been particularly exciting and gratifying to see the increasing role that sustainability research, education, and outreach are playing and the many ways our faculty and students have helped UMaine become a national and a global leader in this important endeavor. This commitment to university community partnerships, interdisciplinary collaboration, and especially to and underscore solutions is the essence of what it means to be a groundbreaking land and sea grant 21st century university. Central to this commitment is the Mitchell Center's growing and I think already established reputation as an honest broker of credible, independent, nonpartisan information to help, to help create a brighter economic, social, and environmental future in Maine and beyond. Here are three quick examples of how interdisciplinary teams of faculty and students are making a difference. Cindy Eisenhower and her colleagues were asked by the Maine Legislature's Joint Standing Committee on Environment and Natural Resources to lead a statewide discussion with diverse stakeholders regarding proposed legislation to address challenges at the intersection of food waste, hunger, renewable energy, landfill management, and agricultural production. All complete, very complicated, very thorny issues and a 
That's an incredible Venn diagram, but it takes a team of people to go in and help sort all this out. Aram Calhoun and her colleagues have worked with representatives of local, state, and federal agencies, environmental organizations, real estate developers, and many others to craft a vernal pool management plan that serves as a national model for more flexible approaches to balance economic development and environmental protection. And the third one, Darren Ranko and his colleagues continue their work to prepare for the expected arrival of the emerald ash borer, an invasive forest pest that kills the ash trees used by Maine Indian basket makers. Earlier this year, the team brought together tribal basket makers from Michigan, New York, and Maine to develop strategies for adapting to the growing scarcity of ash resources. It is fitting, then, that after 10 years of Mitchell lectures, to celebrate the many ways that UMaine students and faculty are serving society through the efforts to enhance the well-being of both nature and society. Now it's time to turn the podium back to David to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to remind everyone that there will be a reception in the Collins Center following the lecture, and we hope you can join us. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Tom Dietz to the University of Maine, and especially to do so on this beautiful day in the middle of one of my favorite rivers in the world, here on the traditional lands of the Penobscot Indian Nation. Tom has had an amazingly productive career, particularly via his focus on strengthening the use of science in decision making. In your programs, there's a brief summary of his accomplishments, and there's much more about him on the web. So I'm going to focus on some of the things that aren't on the web. <laughs> Tom grew up in a blue collar family in Ohio, America's heartland. And he graduated from Kent State University in 1972 with a bachelor's degree in general studies. And that information alone says a lot about who Tom is. First, a degree in general studies. What a great idea. At a time when the world seems to be overflowing with specialists in one field who find it difficult to communicate with specialists in any other field, we need people who can help span boundaries between academic disciplines and between scientists and diverse stakeholders, including decision makers. And if you ask Tom's colleagues, and I have, about his strengths, one of the things they emphasize first is his broad training in both the social and natural sciences and his ability to connect with people and connect ideas. Now for some of you, thinking about the time period when Tom attended Kent State, will immediately bring to mind the student protests against the Vietnam War that were sweeping across our country and the four unarmed Kent State students who were shot and killed by the National Guard on May 4th, 1970. 20 years later, Tom wrote a profound essay in which he reflects on what he calls the spring of 1970. Each year on May 4th, Tom seeks out a quiet place in the natural world to reflect on those events and how they've shaped our world. It's clear that that experience deeply influences thinking about the importance of community and the need to build broad-based social movements. A year earlier, in 1969, the Cuyahoga River, which flows right through the city of Kent, caught fire in Cleveland, a short distance downstream. The Time Magazine story about the fire reported that the river was so polluted with oil and other contaminants that it oozes rather than flows. And that was one of the galvanizing events that launched the first Earth Day in 1970. This experience also had a powerful influence on Tom's thinking about environmental issues and the environmental movement. 
I first met Tom when I entered the PhD program at the University of California, Davis. Davis had one of the largest ecology graduate programs in the world, and it didn't take me long to rec realize that Tom, who had arrived a couple of years before me, was among the most talented and dedicated students in the entire program. Even then, Tom was focused on the important role of sci that science can play in decision making, but not necessarily in the context you might have expected. Davis had, and still has, the nation's leading research program focused on winemaking. Ed Vine, a fellow student, recently reminded me that Tom, in his spare time, was conducting pioneering research on the wine preferences of students. <laughs> his wine tasting parties, and I think he might have called them experiments, were legendary among students, and I'm sure helped him hone his skills in experimental design, statistical analysis, and perhaps even the creation of social capital. I still regret that I was so busy uh, studying at Davis that I failed to participate in this innovative form of what might, what might now be called experiential learning. After Tom finished at Davis, he went on to play many leadership roles, and still does, in the scientific community, especially via his work with the National Research Council, some of which he'll talk about. He has also collaborated with many past Mitchell lecturers, including a long partnership and warm friendship with uh, Eleanor Ostrom, the first woman to receive the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences, who was here in 2010 to present the Mitchell Lecture. Please join me in welcoming Tom to you, Maine. Thank you. You found that paper. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank President Hunter for her warm and very informative introduction, and welcome and and David for his uh, generous introduction and for his uh, reminding me of some things in the background that I haven't thought about in, in some time. Um, I want to start with two quotes uh, that I hope will ground your expectations for my talk. The novelist Andre Gide said, everything has been said before, but since nobody listens, we have to keep going back and beginning all over again. As David mentioned, I've had the privilege of friendship with a number of the previous Mitchell lecturers, not only Lynn, but Baruch Vishoff, Pam Matson, Jane Lubchenco, Bill Clark, and Ruth DeFries. I know they've already covered a lot of what I'm going to say today, but I know not all of you were able to attend those lectures, and in any event, we know that repetition is an important part of learning, so bear with me as I repeat things you've already heard. The eminent statistician George Box has said, all models are wrong, some models are useful. I suspect that much of what I say that is new and original will turn out to be wrong, but if it stimulates our discussion, then it served a good purpose. Um, finally, I want to note that I will gloss over a lot of detail, things that I'll cover in a few slides uh, and a few minutes of conversation will, are based on chapters of books with lots of footnotes, uh, of a book with lots of footnotes that I'm working on right now. The talk comes without footnotes, and so I'll be glossing over some things. I'm going to start with two examples of decisions that matter for sustainability, and then mention just a couple of the challenges we face over the next decades, a few out of the many challenges we face, to give some context for the decisions that we're going to have to make. I'll review what we know about how decisions are made, and uh, suggest that science is one area where we seem to do a good job of making decisions. And that process, the scientific process, provides the core logic for an approach to decision making or for bringing facts into decision making that can help us do a better job in the future. If time permits, I'll conclude with some general remarks about the current situation we face. Let me start with an example of two decisions. Last month, my wife and I bought 34 solar panels in the Vermont Electric Co-op uh, solar farm that's about 15 miles north of our home in Vermont. We split our time between uh, Michigan and Vermont. We've had a house in Vermont for about 25 years. Um, how did we decide to, to buy those solar panels? We talked about what we value. 
We care about how global warming, climate change, is affecting the planet, um, and including humans and other species. We care, of course, about our monthly costs and uh, electrical costs and the payback we get from the solar panels. And we like the, the idea of being innovative. Those are the values that seem to matter in terms of this decision. We also had to assess the facts. We believe that the climate is changing. We believe that the primary cause is burning of fossil fuels. And we believe uh, that the science, uh, that science has made it clear that climate change is having harmful effects on people, other species of animals, and on the planet itself. And we've had 25 years of experience with the co-op, so we believe that they will keep their contract uh, to us in terms of the solar panels. So our household decision required talking through our values and the facts, but it was a pretty easy decision. Let me now turn to a harder decision or set of decisions. My second example of decision is of decisions that were poorly made with tragic consequences. In April 2014, residents of Flint, Michigan, found that their water, their tap water, seemed to be oddly contaminated, and that in some cases, their children seemed sick. My colleague, MSU pediatrician Mona Hanna Atisha, tested the children and found very high blood levels in some of them, and she helped sound the alarm about the problem. Just a week ago, uh, Mona won the Heinz Public Service Award for her work in the Flint water crisis. Where are we now? Many people in Flint are still using bottled water three years after the crisis initiated. Fifteen government officials have been charged with criminal offenses, including negligent homicide. The cost of remediation may be $1.5 billion. That's a year's income for the average, for every family, a year's average income for every family in Flint. And many of Flint's children, unfortunately, will bear the terrible cost of lead poisoning for the rest of their lives. How could such a thing happen? There's a long chain of decisions that led up to it. There's a, a history going back to the 1930s of state government providing funds to municipalities to help cover their, their uh, budget costs. Fiscal conservatives a few years ago in the legislature began to cut back on this decades old practice of state contributions to cities. That created fiscal crises in many cities. In 2011, Governor Rick Snyder used Flint's financial troubles as justification for appointing an emergency manager. Under Michigan law, the, emer the emergency manager had total control of the city government, able to override anything that the elected mayor or city council wanted to do. To save about $100 million in cost, the emergency manager switched the Flint water supply from the Detroit system, where it had been for many years, to the Flint River. The polluted Flint River water proceeded to leach lead from pipes all over town, thus contaminating the drinking water supply. It also spread Legionnaire's disease, resulting in about a dozen deaths. Even as the community was raising concerns about the water, appointed officials were assuring everyone that the water was safe. These officials failed to get the facts right about the risks of using Flint River water, and they ignored inputs from citizens and elected officials. Their values apparently favored fiscal conservatism over democratic process or public health. The point of these stories is that decisions always involve both facts and values. Um, to make decisions that support sustainability, we have to do a good job of getting the facts right and handling our values appropriately. Now I'm going to move on to some examples of the decisions we, we're going to face in the future. The examples of decision making I just gave, our purchase of solar power and the Flint crisis, are in some ways relatively simple. But as individuals, as organizations, as communities, and as a nation, we're going to face much more complex challenges as we try to move towards sustainability in the coming years. Mentioning a few of these upcoming challenges will give a sense of, the, of, of what we're going to have to address. Climate change, of course, which motivated us in part to buy the solar panels, is part of global environmental change. The changes that we're facing are unprecedented in human history. We're going to have species extinction rates that are 1,000 times what has been true in the past, a climate that's been unknown for at least the last 100,000 years, CO2 concentrations higher than any time in the last 800,000 years, ocean acidification levels that haven't been existed on Earth for several million years, and of course, many of the chemicals that we're dispersing into the environment are unprecedented. Life on Earth has had no experience with them whatsoever. 
But the environmental challenges are not the only issues that will require important decisions. We continue to have long-standing problems of poverty, prejudice, inequality, hatred, and violence. We're now overlaying on these old challenges new ones that come from the NIBIC technologies, that is nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive technology. As Senator Mitchell has noted in a talk I viewed online, the impacts of these technologies will be at least as great as those of the Industrial Revolution. Um, just by coincidence, yesterday going through the airport, the Financial Times had, I know you won't be able to read this, uh, that had a, a header up here that says, Robot Rust Belt, Smart Machines Will Hit Some Cities Very Hard. And the current issue of The Economist, uh, the cover story is nowhere to hide what machines can tell you from your face. So this is recognition of how uh, artificial intelligence technologies are going to be transformative. Um, of course, these new technologies will be able to do wonderful things to enhance human well-being and the well-being of other species. We'll be able to eliminate many diseases. We'll probably be able to produce the food, energy, and materials we need with minimal impact to the environment. We can probably move away from some of the worst problems with factory farming. And there are probably uh, benefits from these technologies that we can't even imagine yet. But they, these technologies will also confront us with very difficult decisions. Understanding the facts of what is happening as these technologies unfold is daunting. The challenge to our values may be even more daunting. Let me point to just one aspect of these technologies. The biggest advance in artificial intelligence may well be the ability of emerging AIs and robots to make complex decisions on their own without direct human intervention. This is what gives them the potential to replace jobs that involve a lot of decision making, ranging from cab and truck drivers uh, through accounting, diagnostic medicine, and potentially even a role for robots in combat. We will have to decide how to deal with that job displacement. Even if new jobs are created, as has often been the case when new technologies emerge, it's not certain that those jobs will be available to those who have lost jobs uh, that have been displaced by artificial intelligence. And we also have to be aware that artificial intelligences will be making ethical decisions. Self-driving cars have to decide between protect, protecting passengers and protect, protecting pedestrians. Combat robots may have to make kill decisions. So given those challenges, it's useful to think about how it is that we actually make decisions. This is a major topic in social science research, and I'm going to summarize it very briefly. Danny Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in economics for his pioneering work on decision making, says that we have two ways of making decisions as individuals, fast and slow. Sometimes these are called uh, system two and system one, or affective or cognitive decision making. In slow decision making, we are a bit like Mr. Spock in Star Trek, or the rational actor model of economic theory. We consider all the outcomes and how they influence what we value. We consider the probability of each outcome and discount outcomes in the future relative to those in the present. Thus, we combine these, then we combine these analyses that, to make decisions that, in the jargon, maximize subjective expected utility. We sometimes impose this logic on government agencies when we require them to do benefit-cost analyses before making decisions. There's a lot to be said in favor of this kind of decision making, but the Flint water crisis also shows some of its weaknesses. It's very easy to ignore some outcomes of decisions. This may be because we simply don't know the facts. We don't know what will happen. Or it may be because we're focusing only on a narrow set of values, the short-term economic benefits versus long-term impacts on the environment or human health. Um, a standard criticism of benefit-cost analysis, as it's used by government agencies, is that it's easy to quantify some values, for example, the standing value of 1,000 acres of forest if the forest is cut and sold its timber, but harder to quantify the value of other aspects uh, that, that flow from decisions. For example, it's hard to put a number on the services we get from the standing forest, including uh, recreation, water recycling, erosion, and habitat. Economists work very hard and have made a lot of progress on valuing these non-market goods and services, but it still remains a challenge in terms of using this kind of slow decision making. Fast decision making uses shortcuts that are called in the jargon heuristics and biases. They make life simple. We don't consider all the alternatives, just the ones that are easy to think about or that are most prominent or that are made most prominent through advertising and other mechanisms. We rely on subtle cues about the situation. 
We badly mess up handling probabilities. That's how casinos and the lottery make their money. We underestimate size differences in magnitude of numeric quantities. For example, most consumers are pretty bad at knowing how much energy or water are used by different appliances in the house. We have trouble seeing gradual changes that accumulate over time. These shortcuts make life practical. They probably served us well for the 90 to 97 percent of human history that we spent as food foragers living in groups of a few dozen people. But they can lead us astray, and they're very subject to manipulation. Appealing to our decision-making shortcuts is the essence of much political uh, persuasion and much consumer advertising. We are very prone to what social scientists call biased assimilation or motivated reasoning. We are more likely to accept new information that is consistent with what we already believe. And we let our values influence our beliefs about the facts. If I hold pro-environmental values, then I'm much more likely to accept information that says climate change is causing problems. If I hold values that respect tradition or are largely self-interested, I'm much less likely to believe those things about climate change. When we look at interactions with other people and our ability to make decisions as a group or as a nation, even more problems arise. We engage in what is called homophily. We tend to hang out with people who think the way we do and avoid those who hold different views. Clique formation. Both homophily and biased assimilation are natural, natural, reasonable tendencies. But when you combine them in politics, they can lead to a lot of problems. The groups that form due to homophily have reduced diversity of opinion within them and become more and more different from other groups. Aaron McWright, with his collaborators, has shown that the gap between what conservatives and liberals believe about climate change has grown over the years. This is the graph in the lower right-hand corner uh, with conservatives in red and liberals in blue, and those are uh, changes in beliefs over time. In general, environment has become a highly partisan issue. Overall, Congress has become more polarized, and that's the graph at the left with Democrats in blue and Republicans in red. Uh, the first column, I'm having trouble reading it myself, is I think the House and the right, uh, sec, or the first column is, is the Senate and the second column is the House. And what you can see is that overall, uh, Republicans have become more conservative while Democrats have stayed in roughly the same ide ideological position. Then on top of this, we have the algorithms that social media use to bring things to your attention. They undoubtedly exaggerate this tendency uh, towards reinforcing beliefs you already hold and not acquiring new information. Just as movies are recommended based on what we say we like, we get exposed to new information in general based on what information we already seem to like in, in terms of what the algorithms find in looking at our patterns of viewing. I'll say just a few words about values, which is a major area of research in social psychology. Values are the general goals that people uh, strive for in their lives. Among the most important are self-interest, support for tradition, openness to change, concern with the environment and other species and the biosphere itself, and concern with other humans. That is altruism. Values seem to form fairly early in life and are, they change very slowly. They're closely related to our identities, who we consider ourselves to be. So if I tell you you're wrong about the facts, you may not like it, but there's at least a basis for some conversation there. If I tell you that your values are wrong, that's a pretty threatening statement and maybe the end of the conversation. As a result, we have a lot of difficulty having reasoned discussions about differences in values. Indeed, my observation is that in a lot of conversations, if value differences surface in the conversation, the topic pretty quickly shifts to a discussion of the facts, and we avoid the issue that may be the underlying cause of disagreement. I still see many scientists using what's called the information deficit model to explain policy conflicts. Scientists too often assume that disagreement between their own position uh, as scientists on an issue and the views of the public come from a lack of understanding of the facts on the part of the public, an information deficit. So if the public could just learn the facts, that is, if they could get their minds right, to quote Strother Martin and Cool Hand Luke, conflicts would be resolved. But we know that many, perhaps most, policy conflicts grow out of value differences. Getting the public to agree with scientists on the facts may be necessary to resolve policy conflicts, but it will never be sufficient. Let me move to a parable. This is trying to think about how we could do better in terms of handling facts. Um, let me offer an area where we seem to do very well in making decisions about facts. 
The research on how we make decisions and the problems of polarization is the result of the last few decades. But the idea of polarization is ancient. Consider the parable of the blind observers and the elephant. The story is often attributed to the Buddha and it appears in many world religions. The idea is that a group of blind scholars each examines an elephant and reports on what they have found. One standing near the head says, this is a pot. Another standing near the ear says, this is a fan. Yet another near the tail describes it as a brush and so on. Uh, one wonders what the elephant is doing through all this. We sometimes forget that the world is full of other beings that have lives and agendas of their own. The point of the, para of the story is to decry sectarian divisions, just the sort of splits we observe in politics. But it's often useful to think about what happens after a parable ends. If these were real scholars, especially if they were scientists, they would start debating the evidence. At some point, one of them said, where were you standing when you made that observation? Let me stand there and see if I can replicate your observation. Uh, at, eventually, through discussion and observation, I think they would come to a reasonably accurate picture of the elephant. This is how we do science. Science is a conversation with strong rules about the importance of evidence in deciding what ideas to keep and what ideas to put aside. The process is very powerful. I want to emphasize two points. First, science makes progress not because scientists are geniuses or saints. It makes progress because there's a strong set of rules, norms in the language of sociology, that says ideas get accepted as facts when the evidence supports them. At any point, eloquence, prestige, or skullduggery can play an important role in shaping the state of science. But over time, the process will out. We, individual scientists are certainly subject to the same foils as the rest of us are in decision making. But we correct for this by training and methodology. We learn to think slowly as scientists to avoid the pitfalls of the shortcuts and biases that we use in day to day life. And we insist on broad communication to fight against the formation of the kind of cliques that dominate politics too often. We don't do this perfectly, but we work hard at it. The second point is that science is an evolutionary process and it needs diversity. Diversity in science brings in many viewpoints and makes it more likely that we're going to get at a good approximation to reality, to get the facts. Diversity breaks down the formation of cliques. We need diversity in the kinds of disciplines that are applied to a scientific problem. We need the diversity in the kinds of people who are doing the science. Different gender identities, different races and ethnicities, different social class backgrounds. And when dealing with public issues, we need perspectives in the discussion that are not grounded in science. I'll return to this point. So based on this model of how science works, um, there are some ideas about how to as assess the state of the science to get the facts right for use in decision making, particularly public policy decision making. Um, for about 20 years, the US National Academy of Sciences has recommended a, an approach to linking science to policy, a way of getting the facts right. Scientific analysis in this process is combined with deliberation that includes both scientists and interested and affected parties, the stakeholders. The academies has called for using this approach in dealing with such tough problems as assessing environmental and health risks, climate change, managing wild horses and burrows, and by the way, that's probably the most controversial issue on this list. People care passionately about horses and burrows but have very different values about what we should do with regard to them. Uh, a variety of applications of biotechnology, including modification of the hu human genome and gene drives, and a recent report on science communication. And by the way, if you're interested in science communication, I recommend that report um, in the bottom right to you. It's available online at the National Academies Press. It's short and does a nice job of reviewing the uh, literature. This approach of melding scientific analysis with deliberation helps us get the right science. Interested and affected parties can discuss the, what matters to them, their fears, their hopes, and so on. Hearing this, the scientists can try to do analyses that clarify those issues. As a result, scientific analysis addresses issues that will influence decisions. The process of broad discussion also helps to get the science right. We must often take science developed in one context and apply it to another. Learning how to take knowledge from one watershed to another, for example, or from laboratory studies of toxicity to assessment of health threats to children in Flint. Local insights can help understand how to apply general scientific results to a local context. In the case of Flint, if those making decisions had respected the community's expertise about what was coming out of their taps, 
tragedy might have been averted. But perhaps the most important outcome of this process is that it helps to build trust and mutual understanding between scientists and interested and affected parties. Science remains among the most trusted institutions in the United States. But when we move from science as abstraction to the specific details that we need to inform policy decisions, the public correctly understands that uncertainty increases. And here I quote my colleague and dear friend, Jean Rosa, who is one of our leading thinkers on risk. The typical quote, the typical objections of laypersons then is not to science per se, but to institutions that attempt to maintain a monopoly on knowledge claims and which sometimes misapply abstract science to the peculiarities of local settings, end quote. The late process of analysis and public deliberation helps both scientists and stakeholders come to understand the strengths and limits of the science being applied to a specific problem. Indeed, a major motivation of this approach comes from helping us understand risk and incorporate it into decision making. If, I, as I noted a few minutes ago, our default uh, way of handling with risk and uncertainty is very problematic. We usually get it wrong. So that's one of the reasons this process is so important is when we're dealing with scientific uncertainty. I should also note that linked analysis and deliberation incorporates multiple forms of expertise. Um, we need scientific expertise about the subject matter, of course. We need expertise about processes and decision making that can help design effective processes. Community expertise, which is often called traditional ecological knowledge, helps us get the science right. Um, political expertise brings an understanding of conflicts, assumptions, trust, and informal agreements that matter for making policy recommendations, and everyone brings values to these processes, but we can benefit from having experts in the process who understand how to make value trade-offs and how to help people better articulate their values, including uh, ethicists. Of course, there are, those, there are those who are skeptical of this approach to public and to public participation in general. After all, I've just discussed the many pitfalls in our decision-making. Wouldn't this, those overwhelm this kind of process? So being scientists, we decided to look at the evidence by conducting a study through the National Academy of Sciences. We reviewed about 1,000 studies in the literature. We talked to practitioners and members of the public who had been active in such processes. We commissioned case studies of public participation processes that have been repeated many times, such as Superfund site remediations and uh, forest service forest planning. The report was ex then examined by 20 peer reviewers. That's compared to two to four who examined the standard scientific paper. I want to read the conclusion, which is a statement not by me or by the committee, but by the National Academies of Science. When done well, public participation improves the quality and legitimacy of decisions and builds the capacity of all involved in the policy system. We emphasize in the report that there's no cookbook for designing such processes. Rather, each situation has to be carefully diagnosed, and we offer some diagnostic, diagnostic questions, and a process designed in cooperation with the participants drawing on insights both from the scientific literature on participation and decision making and the experience of skilled negotiators like Senator Mitchell. There are many examples where these kinds of processes are used successfully, not just for assessing the facts, but for making policy recommendations or even making decisions. In some literatures, these approaches are called co-management or negotiated rulemaking. The same basic principles apply, but special care has to be taken to be competent in how values are handled. This includes working hard on fairness, in both process and outcome. Increasingly, scientists will find themselves participating in such processes. For those of you who are pursuing a career in science, I think you should think about these kinds of processes in ways in which you can bring your science uh, into helping build solutions to serious societal problems. Um, I think the future of science communication is not in finding scientists who can be media stars. Rather, it comes from building organizations that can bridge between interested and affected parties and scientists using these linked processes of analysis and deliberation. You here at the University of Maine are fortunate to have the Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions. From what I have learned, the center is one of the best examples of integrating science into decision making I know of in North America. A variety of other centers at very prestigious universities could learn a lot from what you're doing here. You have a source of innovation in how to do this that will lead you to the next generation of linking concerns, uh, linking science with societal concerns. I'm particularly impressed by the fact that the agenda of the center includes not only doing the work, but also stepping back and reflecting on the work 
and doing studies that assess how well various approaches have learned, have worked so that we can learn from experience. At MSU, we're responding to the interest in doing research in Flint following the crisis with the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. The MSU leaders for this center are faculty members who grew up in Flint and still live there. The center links researchers who want to work in Flint with members of the community. This establishes the link process of scientific analysis and public deliberation. Researchers get access to the community and input on, on their research that will help them hone their research questions and methodologies. <coughs> Excuse me. Community members get to influence the research agenda so that it's useful to them and are informed about what is going on. The center helps build trust. A key feature of the Mitchell Sustainability Solutions Center and the Healthy Flint Center and other successful efforts is that they learn from ongoing uh, experience. They work hard to overcome the problems of fragmented networks and the pitfalls of our default decision-making processes. Each effort is viewed as an experiment that, if properly evaluated, can build a knowledge base for future efforts. So I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly here. Um, I want to conclude by saying at least a few things about large national, the larger national context uh, that, that we face in, in trying to integrate science into decision making. I should note that this is a part of the talk where I'm incorporating far more of my values than I have in the previous parts of the talk, which are pretty much based on evidence. These seem to be times when even the idea of facts is under attack. Especially troubling is a growing tendency to dismiss science as a source of facts. None of the current administration's environmental or science appointments accept the scientific consensus on climate change. No one has replaced John Holdren as science advisor to the president. The Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House has shrunk from 135 uh, at the end of the Obama administration to 35 today. But even worse than the lack of scientific advice is malfeasance in discussion of serious environmental problems. This is not a new issue. In the 1920s, when lead was added to gasoline to prevent engine knocking, the industry promoting the use of tetraethyl lead was well aware of the health risks. They saw their workers suffering from the terrible health effects of acute lead poisoning. But they spent decades and a lot of money arguing that the science about lead exposure was uncertain. They argued that no action was needed because of the science was uncertain, and that's a very familiar argument. It is a major argument against taking action on climate change. The tobacco industry used it to attack evidence about the health risks of smoking. It was used to deny the health effects of nuclear fallout. It was used in response to Rachel Carson's concerns with pesticides in Silent Spring. It was used by the fossil fuel industries and the electric utilities to deny, deny acid rain, a, a battle in which Senator Mitchell played such an important role. It was used to deny ozone depletion. This is kind of a, an old playbook that's been used over and over again. We can have honest scientific disagreements about how solid the science is around some issue. The analytic deliberative process I've described are intended to help build understanding of uncertainty about the facts needed for a decision. But ongoing scientific debate is far different from campaigns that play on the difficulties we have in thinking through uncertainty, and that's the nature of these campaigns. What can we do about these tendencies? I certainly don't have the answers. But we will have to use evidence about what works and our best judgments to develop strategies to improve how the political process handles facts and values. We should think of every policy reform, every new effort we undertake as an experiment. We should study uh, these experiments to see what effects each has, including the unexpected and unintended consequences. That is, we should build on uh, what we do to learn how to experiment further and do better in the future. I want to offer very quickly four thoughts on the national scene. First, we have to create a more level playing field for all interested and affected parties to have a voice, and part of that is probably getting money out of, out of politics. Second, we have to reduce the polarization in politics. Preventing gerrymandering is probably essential for this, and if we're going to have serious efforts to reduce gerrymandering and get back to one person, one vote, we need to have a very good census in 2020, and that means adequate funding for the Census Bureau. Third, I think we have to let elected officials know that we expect them to engage with and respect science. If an elected official says, I'm not a scientist, we ought to ask them, then where are you getting your scientific advice? Fourth, we should admit uncertainty about values. We should welcome a political process that doesn't assume we know all the answers in advance, 
but that allows us to, to work through uh, difficult problems with the assumption that we have to come to decisions together, not unilaterally. Finally, I want to make the case that our decisions as consumers and citizens matter. Um, in 2009, with colleagues, I examined how much impact U.S. household behaviors could have on greenhouse gas emissions. Without going through the details of our analysis, I want to note that it's very simple efforts using off-the-shelf technology, not including solar or wind, could reduce U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, total emissions, by 7.4 percent. That's the equivalent to zeroing out the emissions from France or from the U.S. petroleum refining, iron, steel, and aluminum industries combined. So what you do as consumers matters. Your decisions as citizens matter as well. In 2015, colleagues and I tried to quantify the effects of green politics on U.S. state greenhouse gas emissions. Over time, there's been a trend in the U.S. states towards higher emissions, even when we take account of population, economic activity, and other factors. We found that the increase of the impact of increasing pro-environmental politics in a state was enough to counter the overall trend towards increased emissions. Or put somewhat differently, the impacts of increasing green politics had about half the impact on each state as increasing population did on greenhouse gas emissions. So my point is that state politics matter and that you acting as a citizen can actually have an effect not only on the policies that are enacted but also ultimately on our impact on the environment. My, to conclude, we face some very difficult decisions. Some of our natural tendencies in decision making will make it hard to make those decisions in ways that will lead to improved human well-being while protecting the environment. But we also have models of how to conduct effective processes for making good decisions. Our challenge is to continue to improve these processes and to apply them to the big challenges we face in the future. Thank you. So if you have a question, we have uh, Chris Hoffman and Josh Stoll with microphones in the aisles and just, oh sorry, uh, Andrew, uh, and uh, just raise your hand and they'll get over to you so we can get your question recorded. This is being uh, recorded and it'll show up on Speaking in Maine later on. Hi, yes. I'm Jim Lebrecht. Uh, your uh, decision to take uh, invest in solar over in uh, Vermont uh, when weighed against uh, environmental factors in Vermont that are superior to even Maine uh, may not be as good as a decision as you may think. Here in Maine, uh, we decided to invest in uh, heat pumps where we produce eight times the CO2 benefit uh, for the same dollar. And but we also at the same time reduce oil, where Maine uses 100 times more oil for heat and transportation than it does for electricity. Uh, so uh, even LED lights, investing in those, is 16 times the economic value of, uh, of solar panels, uh, fully subsidized solar panels, by the way. So when it comes to reducing CO2, when it comes to reducing oil, uh, heat pumps are 8.3 times more cost effective here in Maine and would be somewhere around 12 times better in Vermont. So your decision may not be uh, following all your rules you pointed out here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, I guess the point I would make is that it's not an either-or decision, that we're continuing to look at uh, further weatherization of the house. We actually were just talking about look at, with a neighbor about looking into heat pump solutions um, and a whole variety of things. So what I would argue is, is that the solar panels contribute. And it's sort of like the, the argument I made about uh, household uh, energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions, that some people have looked at that 7.4% figure and said, that's not going to solve the problem. And that's exactly right. No one thing solves the problem. We need a whole inventory of different activities. And, and I think your point is well taken about heat pumps. And we continually need to think about what kinds of new technologies are emerging, because what the best choice was yesterday or is today may not be the best choice tomorrow. So thank you. And for everybody, take a look at heat pumps as, as an alternative. Yeah. I, I can't see the audience very well from up here, so folks will, the folks with the microphones will have to pick people. 
the Flint, Mich Michigan situation, why didn't the state, when they found out they were polluting people's homes with water, decide to go back and give them water from the same source they had been getting before? Uh, that's a very good question. The problem is, and I'm not a civil engineer, but I talked to the civil engineers working on this, that the corrosive uh, compounds in the river water had mobilized the lead. So it would take a long time for, even with a, a new water supply, for it to flush out. The problem wasn't that the lead was in the Flint River water, but that the water was corrosive. And so the engineers say, you know, eventually with enough flushing, that would work. But, but it could take a long time, and we don't actually know the dynamics of it very well. And so, in fact, some of the studies that are going on have to do with trying to figure out that, di di that dynamic. But also, the, there's the argument that that's a short-term solution because we still have lead pipes all over the city. That's a heritage. So people are saying, well, part of the remediation is we need to get rid of the lead pipes, so this is never an issue in the future. So, but that's my understanding. As, as so they still haven't done much of anything. Uh, what they're doing is going through sort of street by street and house by house replacing the pipes because the sense was, actually, I, they, they, I, I should take that back. They have switched the water supply. It's not back to Detroit. It's to another system that has less problem with corrosion, but they still feel like too much lead has been mobilized in the system now for the water to be safe for quite some time. And as you can understand, a lot of people in the community uh, are not about, the, uh, several government agencies, including the state DEQ, have said, oh, the water is safe now. You can imagine people in that community aren't about to say, oh, we believe you. <laughs> the fact that you, you were misleading us for all those months, uh, we're, we're going to forget about that and trust you now. Uh, indeed, one of the points of the center I mentioned is that when research emerges about water quality in the city now, the residents of the community feel that they were involved in discussing the research and hearing about the research it was, as it was progressing so that they will trust the results of the research. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm a business student here at UMaine, and I just have a question. How can businesses become more involved in political policy on sustainable issues? Ah, th well, business already is involved. There's a book coming out this uh, fall by my friend Mike Vandenberg uh, from Oxford University Press that argues that over the last 20 years, most important environmental policy, or at least a large part of environmental policy, has been made by the private sector. So some companies are extremely responsive to what they perceive to be consumer demand. For example, McDonald's now only has cage-free eggs, and that's because they perceive that consumers care about animal welfare. A uh, wide range of companies are taking very serious steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I, when I mention this, I always like to emphasize that there, companies are as varied as people are. There are some companies that will be terribly recalcitrant forever and will only do things if they're absolutely forced to. There are other companies who are eager to be leaders in terms of sustainability and are quite sincere in their efforts and are doing everything they can. And a whole lot of country, companies that are in between who are making value trade-offs between the bottom line and sustainability and what they uh, perceive to be consumer preferences. But I think that the main message I would give is that a lot of the action right now in environmental policy in the US and around the globe is actually actions by the private sector. And again, Mike Vandenberg uh, has a new book coming out where he talks about this in great detail. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Hang around for just a sec. Oh. Uh, so just to thank Tom for coming all this way, he's been having many minute uh, meetings with students and faculty all day, and it'll keep going after the lecture gets done and into the evening. I want to thank him uh, by giving him uh, one of these beautiful muscle platters from Edgecombe Potter, so handmade in Maine. Wow. Um, middleless edgeless for those invertebrate zoologists out there. <laughs> and uh, uh, also a really interesting, uh, uh, innovative industry in Maine in terms of uh, muscle aquaculture. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. This is, this is beautiful. Thank you. Good talk. It's now my pleasure to turn the podium over to Brady Davis, who will introduce Senator Mitchell. I had the pleasure of getting to know Brady when he played many key roles in two innovative research projects supported by the Mitchell Center, and I'm just one of his many fans. Welcome, Brady. Thank you, Dr. Hart. It is an honor to be here and introduce Senator Mitchell at the 2015 Mitchell Lecture on Sustainability. 
It is a special privilege for me to be here today because for the first time I am attending not as a student, but as a proud graduate of the University of Maine. And as a Mitchell Scholar, thank you. As a Mitchell Scholar, this opportunity is especially meaningful for me because Senator Mitchell has had a tremendous impact on my life. A few weeks ago when I shared the news with my mom that I would have the opportunity to introduce Senator Mitchell, she took it as an open invitation to coach me on how to craft my remarks. <laughs> when I came home a few days ago, I found her at our dining room table hard at work with pen and paper in hand on Senator Mitchell's introduction. She assured me that what she had jotted down was very good, and to prove it, she began reciting what she had written. After only a few lines, however, tears came to her eyes, and eventually she had to stop. After a few moments, she explained that reflecting on the multitude of ways that Senator Mitchell has impacted my journey over the past few years was what made the tears well up in her eyes. I said respectfully that I wasn't looking to make anyone cry, and I thought I had better just write my own introduction. I decided to include that anecdote here because it gets to the heart of how truly influential Senator Mitchell has been on my life over the past four years. What I hope to make clear with this introduction is that Senator Mitchell has not just established scholarships and centers of research, but has created communities of caring people unified by shared visions and that are capable of having profound and lasting impacts on all those that are fortunate to be a part of them. I believe is an understanding for just how transformative these communities have been for me that brought tears to my mother's eyes. More than just financial assistance, the Mitchell Scholarship and the Mitchell Institute have served as academic and professional accelerators that have opened numerous doors for me, connected me to an incredible network of business professionals, and allowed me to form lifelong friends. Likewise, the Mitchell Center has not just been a place where I attended class, but granted me my first opportunities to engage in hands-on research, to explore vital questions about our planet, and to discover a passion for the study and practice of sustainability. As an undergraduate student, I was a research assistant on two separate projects focused on sustainable food systems. These experiences enriched my coursework here at the university and changed the trajectory of my career aspirations. Through a Mitchell Center grant, I was able to participate on a project investigating the sustainability of artisanal cheesemaking in Maine. I spent a summer traveling the state, conducting interviews with cheesemakers, sampling incredible cheese, and learning how farmers and local producers think about and practice sustainability. This research led to my senior thesis and was the capstone project of my undergraduate experience. Senator Mitchell was behind the scenes at the most pivotal moments of my undergraduate career starting before I even arrived at the university and culminating in my very last assignment as an undergraduate student. His influence has extended even further as my first job opportunity out of college has come as a direct result of a Mitchell Institute networking event. And I feel it is critical to note that I am not the only young person to benefit from the many communities that bear Senator Mitchell's name. Since 1995, 2,732 students from high schools across the state of Maine have received the Mitchell Scholarship and gone on to pursue degrees at institutions across this country. Each of these students have been impacted by Senator Mitchell in their own way. Similarly, for the last decade, the Mitchell Center has set students, faculty, and community members to work on vital projects relating to human and environmental well-being. Over 500 undergraduates from institutions across the state have participated in a diverse array of research projects. And these students have been inspired by their work, have been published, and have gone on to pursue graduate degrees. Senator Mitchell has had a far-reaching and profound impact on every sphere of our society, from politics to business to the environment. Each of the scholarships, research centers, and institutes that bear his name carry forward his beliefs and efforts to protect and advocate for the rights, well-being, and sustainability of both people and planet. Outside of my family, I can say with confidence that no one has had a greater impact on who I am today and who I want to be in the world than Senator Mitchell. It is a distinct honor to be able to introduce him today. <clears throat> Please join me in welcoming Senator Mitchell to the podium.
Well, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence here and for your warm reception. David Hart, thank you very much for the great work you're doing heading up this center. Brady, thank you very much for your wonderful introduction. Uh, one of my hopes when I established the scholarship program for Maine high school students was that it would help them develop uh, the aspiration, the skills, the energy to create a bright future for themselves individually and their families and for our state. And so it's really gratifying to see Brady here as one of the more than 2,700 students that we've been able to help. He's embarked on an important career path. As many of you know, under the scholarship program, each year we give a $10,000 scholarship to a graduate from every one of Maine's 133 public high schools. So far, we've distributed over $15 million to them. Most of them stay in the main educational system. They're free to go anywhere. Others go to colleges outside the state, and I'm pleased to tell you that the vast majority either remain in Maine or after some period of time uh, return to Maine and are making a great contribution to our state. So, Brady, you represent uh, thousands of your fellow students, and I want to tell you, as articulate as he is, he is representative of our students. And so, uh, thanks a lot, Brady. I also want to thank you. I want to especially thank uh, President Sue Hunter for her steadfast commitment. Uh, this is the last year uh, of her presidency, and she has dedicated her lifetime, her adult lifetime, largely to the people of Maine and to the students of Maine. And I'm especially grateful for her strong support for this Center for Sustainability and for the warmth with which she's greeted the several hundred Mitchell Scholarship recipients here at the university during her tenure. Sue, thank you very, very much on behalf of all the people of Maine. Uh, as I travel around the state and speak often, I'm frequently asked, do I miss the Senate? And my answer is, uh, like many answers in life, I miss some of it, and a lot of it I don't miss at all. You can guess which is which. Uh, what I do miss most is the opportunity to travel around Maine, to meet, talk with, speak to uh, Maine audiences. Uh, I grew up in Waterville, attended public schools there, and then went to Bowdoin College, so I've lived most of my life in Maine. But I found when I entered the Senate that, like most people, probably like each of you, my life had developed in certain patterns. And while I'd been to a few places many times, most of the places in the state I'd never been to. So for me, it was interesting and exciting. I went to almost every single town in Maine. I spoke at the graduation of every high school in Maine at least once. I visited most business enterprises. And it was pleasant to be treated well, as I was in most cases, also to be challenged, uh, and also to find out that all across Maine, particularly in rural areas, that a, there's a lot of practical wisdom. And it also kept me grounded. I thought of that recently when I spoke in Brooksville, over near Blue Hill, the event was held in a large barn, a working farm. There was quite a large crowd there, several hundred people, and as I entered the barn, uh, a typical smart aleck said to me, you see that sign out there, Senator? And he pointed to a sign at the entrance to the farm in which the proprietors daily posted the products for sale that day. And the three signs posted that day said lamb, pork, 
and manure. <laughs> he said, we're not in much doubt about what you're going to peddle here today, Senator, from those products. And I kind of thought about it, and he'd already made a determination that I was full of BS, and that's what I was going to deliver. And I tried very hard that day to persuade him otherwise. Back when I started in the Senate, I wasn't well known, so I traveled all over Maine trying to meet people. And I traveled one week in the central Maine area, not far from Waterboro where I grew up, in the town of Sydney and adjacent towns where there were a lot of dairy farms. I went to the first day, the first dairy farm I went to, the farmer greeted me very warmly, asked if I would have my picture taken with him and his wife, which I did. And then he asked me if I would have my picture taken with his cows. I said, well, I, I've been asked that pictures taken with cats and dogs, never a cow, but there's always the first time for everything. So I went out and he had a photographer there from the local paper to take a picture of me and two of his dairy cows. There was a story behind it I later learned. The government of Saudi Arabia had hired an agricultural expert in this country to travel the country and pick the best dairy cows they could find because they wanted to purchase and import these prized cows to upgrade the quality of their dairy herd and their milk. And so these two cows, chosen for this prize, purchased at a high price, were going to Saudi Arabia. And the next morning, a picture of me and the cows appeared in a local paper with that story in the caption. By then, I was nearby a few miles away, and I went to a farm that day, and this farmer had a very long driveway off the highway down to his home. You can tell pretty much when you go into a place after you do it often enough how people feel about you, what kind of greeting you're getting. So I could tell when this elderly gentleman opened the door, the look on his face and his body actions that was going to be too receptive. So trying to make small talk, I said to him, boy, I said, you really got a very long driveway coming off the highway here. He said, well, if it was any shorter, it wouldn't reach my house. <laughs> and I, so I put out my hand and I introduced myself. He said, I know who you are. He ignored the handshake. I said, well, what'd you, th I said, how do you, how do you know who I am? He said, well, I seen your picture in the paper with them cows. I said, what'd you think about it? He said, Senator, I'm a Republican. I think we should keep the cows here and send you to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so it's good to be back in Maine, to be brought back down to earth. Uh, I listened with interest to Tom's really compelling and timely remarks. And I want to thank him for coming here today and sharing with us how he has worked to understand and improve decision making throughout his career, and Lord knows we need that uh, in our country uh, and certainly in our public institutions. Tom is, of course, correct to emphasize the importance of considering both facts and values in making decisions. And his insights resonate with me and my own experience in the Senate as Senate Majority Leader and in other contexts. As he stressed, science is usually our best guide to understanding the facts. And that's a key step in identifying the causes of many of our problems, the trade-offs and uncertainties in potential courses of action. But he's also correct that science cannot be expected to tell us what we should care about. We need another way to examine and to reconcile the competing values and visions that exist regarding the goals to which we all aspire, both as individuals and as a member of American society. One of the most enduring lessons I've learned is the importance of listening to the views of others, especially those with whom we disagree. First, to demonstrate respect for individuals and for their beliefs and values, but also while listening to search for potential areas of common ground as we look for answers. 
We live in a world where it's increasingly easy and more likely to be with people who think the same way in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in social media. And so I believe that all Americans need to redouble their efforts to work to understand the views of those who think differently. Whatever our political in inclination, whatever the issue, people on all sides of controversy should ask, why do they believe as they do? Are there valid grounds for their beliefs? Am I somehow missing something? Am I open to the possibility that I may be wrong? These questions come immediately to mind when we consider one of the issues that Tom addressed, climate change, and on which I'd like to add some comments of my own. Since it came into existence, the Earth has gone through periodic phases of cooling and warming, the result of natural forces like volcanic eruptions and variations in the amounts of naturally occurring greenhouse gases. But the warming of the Earth in this past century has been more rapid than ever. According to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, the influence of natural causes is far too small to account for the warming of the past few decades. What does explain it is the dramatic increase in greenhouse gas emissions created by human activity. The burning of coal, oil, and gas for transportation, for heat, cooling for electricity is the primary source of human generated emissions. Although the oceans and the forests absorb gases from the atmosphere, they have been unable to keep up with the rising level of emissions. Last year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change stated, and I quote, Warming of the climate system is unequivocal, and since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented. The atmosphere and the oceans have warmed, the amounts of snow and ice have diminished, and the sea level has risen. 2016 was the hottest year on record. The previous record year was 2015, and before that, 2014. What I've just said is not theory or speculation. It's a considered conclusion, reached and reinforced by scientific inquiry, all widely published and accepted by the overwhelming majority of scientists in the world today. Among the adverse results already occurring are polluted air, droughts, more intense storms and floods, all of which can and do cause sickness and premature death. The World Health Organization has estimated that climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths each year between 2030 and 2050. There is room for legitimate and necessary debate on how to respond to this crisis. Because the earth is warming does not mean that every suggestion to deal with it makes sense. We should now be engaged in a debate as Tom put it, in the intersection of values and facts here in the United States and around the world. We should be assessing the benefits and the costs of many suggestions that have been made to deal with climate change. But that debate is not occurring. 
largely because some leaders in our country insist that there is no such thing as global warming and they oppose any and all efforts to deal with it. Those who now hold that view include, sadly, the current President of the United States, the Administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, and many leading members of Congress. Many of them hold to the view expressed by the President that global warming is a hoax perpetrated by China to harm the U.S. economy. How is it possible for anyone to adopt a position so contrary to the overwhelming weight of scientific evidence? The denial of science is not just wrong factually, it's dangerous for the people of this country and for those of other countries. <coughs> One of the difficulties in organizing an effective response to a threat like this is that it is and seems to many people so distant, so huge, so theoretical that any action by one individual cannot possibly be of meaningful consequence. But to the people of Maine, this is not a distant threat. It is as real and as close as the nearby ocean. The Gulf of Maine, the huge body of water that is just a short drive from where we are now, may fairly be described as one area of ground zero in global warming. In 2015, the Portland Press Herald published a series of reports on the Gulf of Maine, the first of which began with this dramatic statement, and I quote, since 2004, the Gulf of Maine has warmed faster than any place else on the planet, except for an area northeast of Japan. And during the Northwest Atlantic Ocean heat wave of 2012, water temperatures hit the highest level in the 150 years that humans have been recording them. The effects are not fully and precisely predictable, but a reasonable interpretation of recent, recent events should raise deep concerns for the people of Maine. The changes include the loss of entire fish stocks, the movement of other stocks to colder waters, in particular the lobster population, and meanwhile invasive warm water species are entering the warming waters of the southern part of the Gulf of Maine. Time constraints here permit me to just touch the surface of this challenge. I urge each of you to pull up and read the Portland Press Herald series. Also, the Gulf of Maine Research Center and the Bigelow Laboratory have published many articles about the actual observed effects on the waters of the Gulf of Maine and on the consequences to that on the people of Maine. So to us, the threat is not distant in time or place. It is here and it is now. How our country responds to this challenge will have effects all over the world because the United States is and will for as far into the future as human beings can foresee the dominant world power. I have confidence in our country and in the people of our country. I believe that science and reason ultimately will prevail over fear and looking backward. I believe we must 
We can and we will devise the policies to deal with these and other challenges we will face in the coming decades. We're fortunate to be Americans, citizens in a society which despite our many serious imperfections is still, in my judgment, the most open, the most free, the most just in all of human history. Our country stands for freedom, equality, and opportunity for all. That has made it possible for most of us in this room today to lead lives of relative ease, to some degree insulated from the harsh winds of life by our families, our education, our work, our resources, the webs of friendship and influence each of us has weaved over a lifetime. It's in our interest and theirs to make opportunity available to every American. To do that, we must first and foremost be true to our principles. Our democratic ideals distinguished our nation from the very beginning. They always have appealed to people around the world and they still do. Our economic strength is unsurpassed. Our military power is the greatest that has ever been amassed in human history. They're necessary, they're important. But our ideals have been and remain the primary basis of American influence in the world. They're not easily summarized, but surely they include the sovereignty of the people, the primacy of individual liberty, our highest value, an independent judicial system, the rule of law applied to all citizens and crucially to the government itself, and opportunity for every member of society. None of us here no American should ever forget that the United States was a great nation long before it was a great military or economic power. We recognize that all human beings and all human institutions are imperfect. We acknowledge that we are not always right and we can never be perfectly consistent but we can and we must work harder and better as individuals and as Americans to live up to our principles, especially to more fully realize the aspiration of equal justice and equal opportunity for all. In our society, no one should be guaranteed success, but every single one should have a fair chance to succeed. From the experience of our daily lives, we know that full equality remains an aspiration. We must raise our actions to the level of our aspirations. Every child in our society should have the care, the early development and education to enable them to go as high and as far as their talent and their willingness to work will take them, whatever their family circumstances. Our goal should be a society which encourages striving, celebrates success, is conducive to innovation, and enables us to benefit from the talent, the energy, and the skill of every single American. That's our challenge we should make it our destiny. Thank you all very much for being here today. We're going to take some questions. Okay, good. Questions? Take the mic. Thanks, Jeff. On looking at climate change and trying to get negotiations between different countries, 
Um, how do you think we're going to um, get to that um, with the comments last week by the president that all nations should look after their own self-interest and that the United States would always, during a Trump administration, look after its own interests? How do yes. you think we're going to get to negotiations if, if yeah. that's our policy? Uh, any reasonable interpretation of self-interest would, of course, include the potential for harm that can come from activity both within and outside our borders. And we all know that global climate change does not respect, recognize national boundaries. We are affected by what others do. They are affected what we do. I believe it was an historic mistake for the president to announce the withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Accords. But the mechanism established under the Accords interposes a substantial delay in time before that withdrawal takes effect. And it does not limit, of course, the activities of others within our society to take action, notwithstanding the president's decision as it affects the national government. So the actual withdrawal will not occur until a couple of years from now. And in the interim, states and, as Tom Deans mentioned, private citizens, corporations, individuals are taking up the challenge and making clear as the polls indicate, the vast majority of Americans want to continue uh, in the Paris Accords and as to take steps that uh, need to be taken. And I believe that position will, the position of support for concerted effort, uh, will gain broad adherence. Keep in mind that of the approximately 194 countries in the world today, only three are refusing to participate. The United States, Syria, and Venezuela. No other country has withdrawn in the wake of the President's decision. So I believe it's up to us as individuals, as citizens of our state, as members of economic entities, shareholders and corporations, whatever role we have, we play in life, to do what we can to act in accordance with our beliefs and with the reality of science. There once was a time when large numbers of people in the world, perhaps the majority, believed the earth was flat. There once was a time when a lot of people Perhaps the majority believe that the sun revolved around the earth. Over time, science is, and there's still, according to recent polls, about a third of Americans uh, don't believe in evolution. What Dr. Carson said in the nomination contest for the presidency last year expressed his belief that God placed human beings in their current form on the earth just a couple of thousand years ago, he went up in the polls. So it takes a long time uh, for science to be established. There were many who doubted gravity after Newton uh, reached and published his conclusions. But I'm confident, I'm certain, perhaps not in my lifetime, but that it will become more widely accepted as the dangers and the adverse consequences become more apparent, as they are increasingly. So I'm, I'm hopeful for the future. I'm hopeful about our country, and as I said in my remarks, human, all human institutions are fallible, all human beings are fallible. We've made some tremendous national errors in our history. Uh, but in almost every case, we have ultimately 
come to not recognize them, acknowledge them, and act to correct them. And I think that will happen in this case. Yes. Andrew, you want to come oh. down and get Pam Pearson here? Oh, this one. I remember the time when you were majority leader in the Senate, Senator Mitchell, when you withdrew the Hillary Care bill. And I wanted to see if you had a couple comments on what's going on in the US Senate at the per current time about trying to repeal Obamacare. Yeah. <clears throat> While I strongly disagree with both the procedure being used and the substance of the legislation being considered. The, when I was part of the effort to reform a healthcare system which failed, we went through the normal procedures of the Senate. Bills were introduced, they were referred to committees, committees held hearings, dozens of hearings, hundreds of witnesses representing every conceivable point of view testified on the legislation. The committee then met to mark up, that means write the legislation in full public view. And then the legislation came to the Senate floor where we had a very lengthy debate on it. The process now being used is legislation is drafted completely in private. There are no public hearings. In the, in the most recent case, the vote occurred three hours after the bill was first made public. The current effort is going to have a vote without being what the technical term is scored, that is evaluated by the Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan office, the leader of which is chosen by the majority party. So the head of the Congressional Budget Office now is a Republican, chosen by Senator McConnell and Speaker Ryan. But he's doing his job, and his job is to tell the truth, which he's done, and they don't like what he's saying, so they're gonna have a vote without getting a full report from the Congressional Budget Office, because they know what the report will say. That will be devastating to millions of Americans. After President Trump criticized the majority leader, Senator McConnell, the last time they tried and it failed by one vote, I, I did an interview on CNN and a reporter said, well, what do you think about the president? You as me as a Senate, former Senate majority think about the president criticizing Senator McConnell but not being able to pass the bill. I said, listen. He got 96% of the Republicans in the Senate to vote for a bill that had the support of 17% of the American people. 49 out of 52. I said, that takes real skill. If I ever had a turkey like that, when I was Senate Major Leader, I couldn't get 20 people to vote for it. He got 49 out of 52. The content of the bills is disastrous, as, every, as everyone knows. It's why 17, only 17% 17 of Americans support these bills. They will dramatically increase the number of Americans who have health insurance. Uh, they will make it very difficult for rural institutions to stay open. In fact, as I said at the time, here in Maine, the groups most hard hit adversely by the legislation now pending are first, the elderly. Secondly, people living in rural areas. And thirdly, working Americans with low incomes. Well, how do you define the population of Maine? It'll be a disaster for our state. And, and yet, it's very clear that 90% or more of the Republican members of the Senate are going to vote for it, and the only question is whether they can get above 96, whether they need 98% to, uh, to pass it. 
I, I think it's very unfortunate. I, I hope and pray for the sake of the people of Maine and the people of our country that uh, the effort is not successful. Every single organization that is involved in health care in any way, the doctors, the nurses, the insurance companies, everybody has expressed opposition to this legislation on the grounds that it will be disastrous for our country and for, more, for the people of our country, and yet it's being pursued for a purely political goal, which I think uh, is very unfortunate. Other than that, I, I don't have any strong feelings on it. <laughs> 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 So, so we're near the end. I just want to uh, express our gratitude to Senator Mitchell uh, for every bit of what he's said and what he stood for his entire life. Uh, I want to present to you a book of photographs of Maine in the early 20th century from an amazing collection of more than 15,000 glass plate negatives called Maine on Glass. I actually had the pleasure of meeting one of the book's authors, uh, Kevin Johnson, who's a curator at the Penobscot Marine Museum. And I can assure you, you're in for a treat. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. In closing, I just want to thank our two stellar speakers. Where else do you hear talks like this back to back? As well as the co-sponsors of the Mitchell Lecture, a bunch of wonderful colleagues and friends across the campus. Many students, including Mitchell scholars and Andrew and Chris doing the mics just now, Josh earlier, who helped out today. Particularly grateful for all the wonderful colleagues in the Mitchell Center. And I, I just want to be clear that none of this could happen without Ruth Halsworth and Carol Hamill. Uh, you're all invited to join us for a reception in the foyer of the College Center. And I encourage you to track down Tom and get him to tell you about the pioneering wine tasting experiments he conducted in graduate school. Thank you so much.